another in our series of Middle East brown bags. I see some new faces, which is a pleasure. Um, we, I have the, let me get out of the light here. I have the pleasure to introduce a very distinguished Israeli journalist, uh, someone who, who I've been reading for years and years, and I did not have the opportunity to meet until today. I unfortunately was unable to attend the prize ceremony at which he, uh, at which he and a fellow journalist uh, received uh, an award here at the journalism school because I was away. Uh, Akiva Aldar is the diplomatic affairs analyst for the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, though that does not actually sum up all that he writes for Haaretz. His, his writings cover a, a much broader range than that title would indicate. He's been covering developments in the Middle East for uh, 20 years. And he is the co-author of a new book, which I'll, uh, whose title I will mention. And actually, that's the title, Lords of the Land. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the title of his talk, uh, in fact. Um, his interview with Yasser Arafat, just before he died in 2004, was the last that he gave to an Israeli journalist. He was also the first Israeli journalist who interviewed uh, Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, when he became the first Palestinian prime minister in 2003, uh, before he became president, obviously. As Haaretz's Washington correspondent, uh, Akiva Eldar reported on American-Israeli relations in the mid-1990s. And in fact, his reporting was better than almost anything you could get in the American media, uh, which is often the case for the Israeli Which press. was quite easy. Yeah, that's sadly <laughs> true. Um, prior to that, he spent a decade uh, as the diplomatic correspondent of Haaretz. You may have seen him on television. You were on a show last night or yesterday? Charlie uh, Rose, was it? No, I'm doing Charlie Rose today. You're doing Charlie Rose today. I knew you were going to be on Charlie Rose. Yes. I didn't know. I know. He's taping it today. Okay. I don't know. Um, the Financial Times named him one of the most influential commentators in the world in 2006. I only wish more people in this country read him. He is available in English on the Haaretz website, and I strongly recommend you, you have a look. Um, he, he's the co-author of this book, Lords of the Land, The War Over Israel's Settlements Made by Territories, which was recently published by Nation Books. Uh, his talk today will focus on the settlements as an impediment to both peace and Zionism. So, without any further ado, I'll keep on going. Thank you, Professor Khalidi, and thank you for... Put this water over here. <coughs> Some water for you. Sorry. Thank you. It's important. For stopping by, and uh, I, I hope that uh, all of you will also, at the end of my talk, was uh, will rush to the bookstore because you could will not you could will not be able to wait and see the rest of uh, the uh, story. Um, we actually, ah, we okay. Have books here for <laughs> signing and purchase after the talk, so we'll break five minutes early so so the people don't get trampled. <laughs> um, this is a very um, Zionist book. It's a book about uh, people, and uh, not only settlers, people on both sides of the aisle, the settlers, and actually they are, they are not on uh, negative sides of the aisle, which are the settlers and uh, the uh, Israeli establishment, the political establishment, military, legal. You can add to this the American administration, if you like, even the European, because this is uh, the, the <coughs> settlements are the demonstration of a failed diplomacy. Uh, I have a friend, Alvaro de Soto, who was the uh, uh, last uh, UN emissary to uh, the West Bank, and I think he will agree with me that while he was there and uh, watching the settlements closely, he could see how they keep growing. It's like, you know, um, they say that after people die, the nails keep growing. So after we uh, signed the Oslo Agreement, it keeps, <laughs> it kept growing. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to take it, I, I, I don't want to go into the argument whether a two-state solution because uh, I don't want to get into trouble with Professor Halidi. If a two-state solution is, is still uh, is better than a one-state solution, if uh, the whole demographic issue is is uh, a subject that should be discussed among uh, liberal people, but I will take it from the point of view of the settlers, 
okay, and the mainstream Israelis, and I will try and answer the questions whether the settlements are actually uh, bringing us closer to the uh, uh, exercising the Zionist vision uh, or not. Well, why doesn't it move? Okay. Now, um, the uh, document that demonstrates the Zionist vision, actually the Zionist, the, the uh, political um, exercise of Zionism is the State of Israel. The uh, most important document that represents the State of Israel's ideas and, and uh, uh, platform is the Declaration of Independence from May 1448 that is suggesting that Israel will be Jewish, democratic, safe, reaching for peace, and just, just moral. Now, let's, let's try and see if uh, the settlements are supporting the need, first of all, for a Jewish state. This is number one. I mean, the whole idea of uh, the UN recognizing Israel uh, as, uh, you know, it's very strange. We are now in November 2007, and every 30 years uh, in November, there, there is a, a, something is happening to us. Um, actually, it, it's a very lucky time for the Jews, not so much for the Palestinians. Starting from the Balfour Declaration, which is November 17, then 47, November 47, the UN. November 2nd. Yeah, but it's all November. November yeah. 2nd. Yeah. And then tw November 29th, mm -hmm. okay, uh, the uh, UN resolution, partition plan. Then November 19, Sadat's visit, which was the first recognition, actually, of Israel, 77. So it's, again, the cycle is 30 years. And now, 30 years later, November 26, probably, uh, going to be the Annapolis meeting. And we will talk about this later and try and figure out if this is going to be an important junction as well. Now, uh, look at the figures here, and uh, I think that the answer is clear. Are the settlements making Israel more Jewish? Uh, actually, if, uh, uh, if you want to uh, try a conspiracy theory, maybe the settlements are a Palestinian idea. <laughs> because at the end of the day, you know, they, they are the worst enemy of Zionism. Because, uh, you know, I, I, I just published yesterday an article in the, in the forward, and I think I found uh, in, in a nutshell, the, the, uh, in, in, in one line, the dilemma. The dilemma is between a, a small and beautiful Israel and big and ugly. Um, so it's big, you know, but look at the figures. Already today, uh, if you look at uh, the occupied territories, and I'm not including Gaza, and it's a mistake not to include Gaza, but you know, I give them the benefit of the doubt that Gaza is not occupied. Gaza, according to the international law, is occupied. Israel is responsible. If the international community will decide tomorrow, the donor countries, to stop uh, channeling money into Gaza and people will start dying, it will be Israel's responsibility. It will be, um, uh, it will be um, Israel's responsibility because we control the crossings, the airspace, and, and, the, the, uh, and, the, sea, and, and the seaport, which is, doesn't exist. But already now, 54% uh, Jews and 42nd, uh, 46 percent not Jewish, this is a binational state. This is not a Jewish state by uh, universal parameters, uh, this is already a binational state which discriminates part of its population. It's, uh, it's not Jewish and it's not democratic, and we will get to democratic state now. Now, this is what the Declaration of Independence is suggesting. They used, at that time, they didn't know what the gender is, so they used sex, as you see, the race of sex. This is the official translation. I didn't translate it myself.
do the settlements enhance democratic values? I know that there are some questions that are very stupid because the answers are clear to you. But let's still spend a few minutes on this. There are three different sets of laws in the occupied territories. There is the Israeli law that applies to the Israelis, to the settlers, to the Israeli army, to uh, Israelis who visit the settlements. They can use different roads. Um, and uh, there is the military law that uh, applies to the Palestinians, as well as the Jordanian law when it comes to planning, zoning, uh, civil administration. Part of it is military, since it's uh, still the military governor is in charge. And part of it is uh, the Jordanian law, and some of it is even the Ottoman law. When it's convenient to us, we go to the Ottoman law. For instance, the, the invention of state land, which is everything which is not private land, which is when people are not able to come up with documents to prove that they own the land, it becomes a state land. And according to the Ottoman law, uh, the state is the colonialist, which is in this case Israel. And you know how you define uh, state land from, uh, from private land? It's, uh, it starts where you, you cannot hear somebody shouting from the village. Somebody, this is the Ottoman law. Uh, from, from the, uh, um, you, you stand in the field and somebody is standing in the village and he shouts and you follow him and from the point where you cannot hear him shouting anymore, this is where the state land starts. Uh, and uh, this, of course, applies to the Palestinians. More than that, um, the uh, settlements have produced now the uh, uh, control of the halachic authority over parts of the Israeli uh, constituency that lives there and in Israel. Um, if you read this line, Besheva is the settlers magazine. Uh, this is in, this relates to the disengagement and this rabbi who was the chief rabbi, I mean he is not one of those fringe rabbis. He was an official government chief rabbi of Israel. And he just passed away a few weeks ago. And he was asked if the soldiers should uh, uh, obey, follow the orders of their commanders if, to evacuate Jews. As the answer is a, an Iranian answer. I mean, this could be an Ayatollah answer. This is not democracy. The idea of establishing a Jewish state after the Holocaust, of course, was uh, that uh, the uh, Jewish diaspora deserved to have a piece of land, safe haven for the Jews, uh, who will have a place on earth to escape to. Uh, and uh, the international community was even willing to turn a blind eye to the fact that it was on the cost of the Palestinian people because of the trauma of the six million people who perished. And the idea was that uh, if things like this will happen again, if the Jews who suffer from anti-Semitism uh, will have a safe place. Uh, in the Middle East it happens. I mean, uh, they didn't, you know, the story about Moses, uh, why he brought us there, that he was a stutter. And uh, actually, he, when he was asked where should we go, he wanted to say Canada, but uh, the Jews were impatient. <laughs> so they went to Canaan. <laughs> Uh, uh, you never heard it? Of course, uh, it was worth coming here just for this. <laughs> uh, oh, California. <laughs> um, now, is Israel, because of the, are the settlements making Israel more attractive to Jews who, will, who are looking for a safe haven? Now, since the Second Intifada, the IDF deployed two extra divisions, it's extra divisions, in the West Bank. Now, uh, I will give you a million dollars to any of you if you will find me one military expert that will come here and say that the settlements are 
uh, military asset that they make Israel, or in, in simple words, if uh, this Ariel, the settlement of Ariel, and we'll look at the map later on, uh, is protecting Tel Aviv, or the children of Tel Aviv who go to the army are protecting Ariel. Uh, you, you won't find anyone. I mean, this was, there were many people who, right after 67, believed that uh, the, the occupied territories are a buffer zone between Israel and Jordan. But, as you know, this is not the case anymore. Maybe one day when, uh, if the President of the United States will keep making mistakes, it will, we will need a buffer zone between us and Iran. But uh, it, it may happen, but we'll talk about this later. Now you see the number of Israelis, uh, and uh, let alone the number of Palestinians, but we are looking at it from, from their point of view. You know, I'm, I'm not looking uh, uh, at, at the question of, and this book is, is a book that was written by Israelis, who uh, the perspective of this book is not objective. It's from the point of view of uh, Israelis who uh, were doing, uh, I believe, the most comprehensive study on a political and sociological phenomena in the Israeli society. Uh, so it, it's not an American journalist that is looking from, from New York at, at, this, uh, at this issue. Actually, it's amazing that this is the first book that was ever written on the most interesting and important political uh, developments in Israel since um, the establishment of the state. Um, you see the budget of uh, security for the occupied territories. Uh, and this is mainly uh, to uh, send the soldiers to do police work and to escort the settlers' children, uh, their daughters to, uh, and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, uh, sons to uh, ceramic and ballet classes. This is what our soldiers are doing. And from a security point of view, I don't know if you follow this, but uh, the military analysts believe that uh, the uh, one explanation of the blunder of the last Lebanon war, uh, that the IDF was not prepared because they were busy doing police job in the West Bank instead of training for the real thing. Um, and uh, the budget of the Ministry of Interior Security was doubled because they have to check bags everywhere in Israel. And they have to check bags because we don't have peace. And, and then we get back to this later. And we don't have peace because uh, we are trapped by those settlements and there is no Israeli government that is able or willing to give them back. Now this is easy. Are the settlements making uh, us uh, fulfill this vision of peace? to extend our hand to all our neighbor states. Now, uh, are the settlements promoting peace? East Jerusalem, which was the first one to be annexed, and uh, then the settlement blocks that are becoming now a, a big issue between us and the Palestinians, because in return for the settlement blocks, we will have to offer something. As you know, the uh, um, Palestinians made it very clear that uh, the 22 percent of greater Palestine or greater Israel is not negotiable. This, and this is true since the Algier Declaration in 88, which is also November. November. November 15. Um, and this is not going to change. I, I, as as uh, Professor Khalidi mentioned, I, I interviewed Arafat, I interviewed Abu Mazen, I interviewed Salam Fayyad, and I hear from all of them the same message. The message is that we don't have a mandate to give one inch more than we were authorized by the PNC, the Palestinian National Council, the PLO, that hardly exists now, uh, in, in 88. So we are starting the negotiations with the Palestinians were with our hands tied by the settlements because we already now, Olmert, will find it very difficult politically to give up the settlement blocks because the opposition, Netanyahu, will tell him, hello, you got a letter from President Bush that you can keep those settlements in April 2004. 
And so you are giving away the Palestinians what you got from the Americans? You got from the Americans? Settlements, territories? So it gets the whole thing much more complicated. I mean, the negotiations are much more complicated. Just try, close your eyes, and just uh, envision that we didn't have settlements. And we had just to negotiate the occupied territories that uh, were kept, as uh, we heard at the beginning in 67, as bargaining chips. Uh, like Moshe Dayan said, waiting for a telephone, and then we will give it back. I remember I was, I'm, I'm old enough to remember, I was a student in Jerusalem at that time, and this is what we heard, that this is a bargaining chip. We are not going to stay there. And actually, 30 years of peace with, with Egypt prove that uh, if you don't have too many settlers, like in the case of Yamit and Sinai, it's much easier. Can you imagine that there were 270,000 settlers in Yamit and in Sinai? We wouldn't have peace with Egypt. Or uh, it would be much more difficult. Now, again, we have this great opportunity by the Arab League Peace Initiative that is offering us normalization in return to the 67 borders. And again, this could be much easier to, uh, um, to agree on if we didn't have settlers there. Look at the figures here. What is the message that Israel is sending to the Palestinian and to the international community? In Oslo, 93, which was supposed, this was the common, common wisdom to lead to a two-state solution, which means two-state solution bring Israel back to the 67 lines. And today, in Annapolis, we are looking at from Oslo to Annapolis. Now, this is without Jerusalem. Jerusalem, we don't deal with Jerusalem in this book because it would, this book in Hebrew was 650 pages. In English, it would be more than 1,000 pages. And Jerusalem would require another 200 pages, so we gave up. But Jerusalem is, of course, is, uh, is occupied territory. Uh, but this is bad enough, so, <laughs> you know. Look at the uh, separation wall. Separation wall is 790 kilometers. You know what is the length of the green line? 350 kilometers. And why, what is the difference? The settlements. And we will look at those fingers that Israel is sending into, penetrating into the territories, turning the wall, which was officially called the security wall, into settlements war. And of course, the roadblocks, checkpoints, the so-called liberal occupation. Um, and of course, the settlements are, if we're talking about peace, it's not only with the Palestinians. The settlements are making it harder for us uh, to uh, maintain, even to, to maintain this cold peace we, has, we have with Egypt and the little warmer peace with Jordan a just state. The Jews first attained a state who created cultural values, 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 will be based on justice envisaged by the prophets of Israel. Are they promoting justice? It's injustice, it's double injustice. It's justice towards the people in the occupied territories. You see, we took 40% of our land to build only on 2% of the land let alone water, where the, the settlers are getting um, as double amount of water that the Palestinians get. Forty percent of the settlements were built on private Palestinian land, especially in the Jordan Valley. I don't know if, how many of you know the story, that uh, almost the in all the settlements in the Jordan Valley were built, and this is according to the state's controller report, um, illegally on uh, Palestinian land of the displaced Palestinians. Some of them are double refugees, people who fled in 48 or were drawn up in 48. They moved to the uh, um, Jordan Valley, and in 67 they moved to Jordan. There are about 350,000 of them sitting on their suitcases, hoping to be allowed to go back. 
Israel, since the Intifada started, is not even allowing them to visit their families. We used to have the summer visits. You remember, we stopped all this. No more family reunification because the, uh, the government is afraid that if they will cross the bridge, they will go to court and will sue us and Israel will have to give them back their land. According to the Israeli law and the, jo the Jordanian law, this was just, this should have been only a deposit that we should keep for them and not touch it. Now it's also injustice toward other Israelis. Ten billion dollars of Israeli taxpayers was, is, is being invested, and I'm talking about, for instance, uh, tax exemptions that they are getting, uh, special mortgages, grants to buy uh, free land that they are getting, uh, 20 children in a class instead of 35 children in Israel, um, jobs, um, certain, in certain settlements you can find as many as 50 percent of uh, the people who are uh, government workers, federal workers, or municipal workers. Uh, and see what Israel Ha'el in Akuda, which is the New Yorker of the uh, settlements, <laughs> of the settlers, and he writes in Aretz, what he wrote in 2004 uh, when he was doing some soul searching and asking uh, why is the, why are the uh, Israeli, why is the Israeli majority turning their they're turning their back to us and they are not joining us to rally against the, what they call the transfer from Gush Katif. And this is his answer. We are not sensitive to what is happening around us, outside our settlements, and he calls this the, bu the bubble. He hates it when I, I did it to him once when we were on a panel discussion. <laughs> I, I, I brought this, <laughs> yes, in Hebrew. Now, having said all this, now I will try to be a little optimistic. The settlement movement is a blunder. Look at the figures. Sharon was talking in 77 when the Likud took power. His vision was to bring one, you'll find it in the book, one million Jews to the West Bank. One million. What do we have now? Actually, if uh, you look at the map, and we'll look at it, uh, it in a moment, uh, besides those uh, settlements who are suburbs of Jerusalem or Kfar Saba, and uh, people are commuting every day from there to Tel Aviv to work, uh, out of 270,000 settlers, only 8,000 are real settlers. All the others can be swapped very easily. They, they live on the 2% that the Palestinians are willing to enact. So if they wanted to be an obstacle to peace, they have failed. There are only 4.4% of the entire Israeli Jewish population, which is about 6 million. And from the West Bank, <laughs> After all they, they are doing to the Palestinians to make, to make their life look like hell, there's still only 12%. Now, and now the question is, having said all that, is it possible to correct this mistake and save the Zionist dream of a two-state solution? Now, I couldn't believe it, but I can't believe that I'm saying it, but I have the same dream as Ehud Olmert. A two-state solution. You know, uh, I can just welcome him to the club after so many years. You know, we went to school together. We studied psychology together. And uh, I was on already then. I was against the occupation. I don't know this part I don't mention in my official bio, but I was against the occupation before the occupation. I was uh, working in the Israeli Muhabarat before 67 in Nazareth. In the, in the, with the Shabak, and actually I was, when I was a soldier, I was 18 years old. 
I was a conscript. I was working in the military government, which was part of the Shabak, which actually we locked it, the offices. And I knew in 67, I knew exactly what it's going, what it's mean, it will mean. And in 67, when I was in the student union, I joined the left against Ol Olmert, who was already there in the Likud. And uh, when I, I, I'm not even sure if I did saying what he says today about the need for a two-state solution and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and I was labeled by him a traitor. So let's see if we can still, since Eud Olmert now is uh, uh, a supporter of a two-state solution, let's see if we can do this. Now, there are a few documents on which we can base our analysis and try to figure out if it's possible. Uh, these are the instruments with which we, we, we have to work now. The Arab League and the Muslim Council that uh, made the, the statements they're willing to recognize Israel within the 67 borders. Uh, and and uh, no, the answer to the question whether they are willing to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, what we want the Palestinians to do, the answer is no. And if you show me where the Egyptians have, or the Jordanians recognize Israel as a Jewish state, I will join the campaign demanding the Palestinians to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, because it's coming up now. Now, um, we have those three American International Quartet documents. First, the Bush, the American, Vision 2002 of a Palestinian state, viable Palestinian state, we'll come to this. The roadmap of 2003 that also mentions the Arab League um, initiative from the original one from March 2002 that was ratified in uh, last March, and the letter to Sharon in 2004 which is not uh, completely just pro-Israeli. There are some good elements there. Uh, this is the basis for a two-state solution, that of a safe and secure Israel. This is, all of this is part of those documents. And a sovereign, these are quotes from the documents. Independent, democratic, and viable Palestinian state, living side by side uh, in peace and security. Now, there are three issues to be solved after uh, we see those principles. There are still issues to be solved, and these are the three issues that um, we will look at and see what has to be done here. Borders. It says that the Israeli occupation that began in 67 will be ended, which means the borders are the June 4, 67 borders. Contiguity of the West Bank, a state of scattered territories will not work, which means that the borders uh, should not look like uh, Sharon's Bantustan's idea, like the, the enclaves. Uh, meaningful linkage between the West Bank and Gaza also, this is another thing that we will have to do. And uh, at the same, the same time, Israel has to have secure and recognized borders, which means that the borders have to be mutually agreed upon. It says also it will not, uh, from, for the Israelis, that it will not be a complete return to the armistic lines of 48, but changes must be mutually agreed. Now, mutually agreed means actually swap, because the Palestinians will not agree to give Israel territories for nothing. That's clear, and people forget that even Bush was careful enough, or the one who wrote it for him, because I, I can't believe that he wrote it. I, I'm not sure if he read it. Uh, it says that the changes must be mutually agreed. They were very careful about this. And the borders will reflect the realities, which is the, uh, the blocks. But again, if it has to be mutually agreed, of course, there has to be some symmetry here. And this is what is missing. In the, if, we, if we are looking at the document that has to come out of Annapolis, it has to be clear that it has to be symmetric and there has to be equality, which these words are missing in the, in the documents. And here is the map that uh, 
um, we will have to start working on. Now, the green line is very clear. You see the green line, Jerusalem municipal borders, the Jewish locations. No, no, this is, this is the green line. Get your pointer. Yeah. This is the green line. <coughs> this is the Geneva Accord borders. You know, the Geneva, the Bailey, and Abed Rambo. And this is the barrier. You see? So that's the Geneva. Yeah. This is the Geneva map. Okay, so it's not an official map. No, 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 no. This is, here you have three different lines. You have the green line, you have the uh, Geneva Accord, and you have the Israeli barrier, which is the, the wall, as you see here. Now, the wall is still not completed here. If you take the Geneva line, this is 2%. If you take, if you add to this the, if the original root of the wall, you end up with 8%. The problem is that we don't have 8% to offer the Palestinian, which is not inhabited. And uh, if you remember, if you followed uh, Abu Mazen's statement from a few weeks ago, he was mentioning the figure of 6,240 kilometers, square kilometers that Israel will have to give them back. And he said we will be willing uh, to swap 2%. 2% is exactly the, uh, is exactly, you see, here is the, the root of the fence here goes along the green line. You see? Uh, now, um, here, this is what the Geneva uh, map is suggesting. The red. The red. You see, this is the Geneva Accord uh, with very limited area for Malaya Domim. Now the, court, the uh, uh, Supreme Court will have to uh, decide whether they accept this route or this route. The, this is the official route of uh, defense or what uh, Shaul Ariely and the Council for Peace and Security is suggesting is the, the <coughs> more or less the Geneva route that uh, doesn't take anything from the Palestinians here. And uh, if you see here, these territories, this is the swap areas that will be given to the Palestinians in return inside Israel. Okay, so this is the 2% here and 2% here that will be swapped. Is it clear? Because you see that this, the route goes a little bit inside and a little bit outside into Israel, behind the green line. Now, 2% of the 6,240 is exactly the 116, more or less, square kilometers that Geneva is suggesting to take from the West Bank and give the Palestinians in return territories here and in Gaza. This is not, actually this is not the 2%. This is, this is more or less half of the 2%. The rest of it will be given them in Gaza. Now there is more land, free land, here in the Gilboa area that the Palestinians would like to have. So if we want to take more land, we will have to give it there. So it has to be, s symmetry is very important here. The, as long as the total is 100% of the 22%, okay, of uh, the 100%, which is the uh, entire territories of Israel. Refugees, any, any question about borders? Because it's a little complicated. It's clear, okay. Next is refugees. Now, um, I think that uh, the Arab League took a very important decision by saying that it has to be agreed upon. Now, uh, I know that many Palestinians will, will not agree with me, especially those who live in the diaspora, um, that uh, Israel actually has now a veto. The Arab League gave Israel a veto because if it has to be agreed upon, it is very clear that Israel will not agree to the right of return. Tsipi Livni made it clear that even one Palestinian will not be allowed to go back 
on the basis of the right of return. Now, I think that the missing, missing components here that uh, have to be worked out in Annapolis is compensation and rehabilitation. I think that 194 is missing here, and I should have added it. 194 it must be here because if you take off 194, there is no compensation also because 194, uh, Resolution 194 is, uh, actually it's not a, it's a UN General Assembly, is um, not the Security Council, which is different, uh, is offering the Palestinians the choice between compensation and return. So if you take it off, they, you take off the basis for, for uh, the Palestinian requirement of compensation or, or uh, their argument for compensation. And mutual respect of rights. I think that uh, mutual respect is, is very, a very, very important element. I'll tell you a little story that uh, comes to my mind when I talk about respect that uh, will give you an idea what I mean. And there is, there is symmetry here. A couple of years ago, I, I was, uh, besides being a journalist, I was also a member of uh, a workshop on Jerusalem. We used to meet uh, every f few weeks uh, with a Palestinian group, uh, Israelis who are experts on Jerusalem. Jerusalem was one of my hobbies. I was, I started my career many years ago as a, a Jerusalem reporter, and I was, before I was a journalist, I was the spokesman of Teddy Kolek, the mayor of Jerusalem. So I have a hang-up with Jerusalem, and I lived in Jerusalem for 35 years until it became impossible. And uh, we were, we were uh, discussing uh, a roadmap for Jerusalem, and uh, we were very close to, to an agreement about the idea that Jerusalem should be an open city and so on. When we came to the issue of the Temple Mount or Haram Sharif, one of uh, my Palestinian colleagues said something very cynical about uh, our claim to that our Beit HaMikdash, that our holy um, temple, Beit HaMikdash, was actually at this place. And you know, Arafat used to say that it was actually near Nablus, and he made a, a provocative remark. And uh, most of the Israelis who were in the room were very upset, and uh, we almost broke up. But it was lunchtime, so we went to the dining room. Everybody was hungry, so we took a break and we went to have lunch. It was in a hotel in Nicosia, I have to say, because, you know, for Israelis and Palestinians, it's much easier to meet in Europe or in, uh, than to Israel because they, they cannot get permits to get into Israel, so they have, we have to fly all the time uh, to, you know, Turkey or Cyprus, places that are not too far. And Nicosia actually was a good place because it's also a divided city, so we could learn something from uh, the Cypriot people they came over. And we went to the dining room, and uh, uh, God's wish was that they were serving pork. And there was, <laughs> there was the cook was standing there and slicing pork. And guess what? All the Israelis were lining up. <laughs> and all the Palestinians went to the buffet. And one of the Palestinian, maybe you know him, Samich al Abed, he was, I saw him standing there and smiling to himself, you know, looking at us. And I went to him and I said, uh, Samich, what's your problem? He said, You're crazy. I mean, I cannot figure out anymore <laughs> what you're up to. And five minutes ago, you wanted to kill us because we said something, we did say something, you know, questioning your attachment to. Uh, the Temple Mount, and here you are eating pork. <laughs> so, you know, I said, now I understand, I know what is the solution. I will never understand why it is important to you that I will recognize your right of return, and probably you will not figure out why for a secular Jew like me that eats pork and shrimps and, and drives on Shabbat and, and is doing every possible sin why it is important to me that you will recognize my attachment. So you know what, let's forget understanding. Let's say we respect it. And the deal will be, I will respect your right of return, 
you respect my attachment to the holy sites. At the same time, we will say, you know, we are not going to exercise our right or fully exercise our right, and this will be the symmetric deal. And the next, a symmetric, this will be the symmetry here. It will be symmetric that I respect what you need is that I, I respect your right to return to your house. I respect it. You respect my need or my attachment that this is my history, the, uh, the Temple Mount. But we, we don't have to exercise it. I mean, I don't need to have the sovereignty over the Temple Mount and you don't need to bring all the Palestinians back to Palestine because it won't work. If I will demand to have sovereignty of the Temple Mount, there will not be a deal. If you demand that there will be a full recognition and implementation of the right of return of Palestinians to Israel, four million Palestinians, there will not be a deal, even if you have the right to do this. Even if uh, it's immoral to say that you don't have it. It's not practical. And it's not practical for me to say, I want to have sovereignty. I want to have the Israeli flag on the mosque. It's crazy. It won't work. It won't fly. So, you know, we have a, a kind of a, a bumper sticker of the uh, Ministry of Transportation. On the road, don't be just. Be smart. I mean, you can cross the green line in the green line and get, still get killed because maybe there is a crazy driver there. So you end up, you know, in hospital in the best case, and you go and you say, I was right, I crossed the green light. So maybe, not maybe, the Palestinians have the right. And the question is, how do you deal with it? I think that this is one of the options to work out an agreement. Jerusalem, I think that, uh, uh, what is missing from the do those documents is that each side will have sovereignty. And this is more or less what Clinton has suggested. And uh, each side will control its own sites. And uh, of course, it's, it's much more complicated than it looks. But I think that if this will be agreed, if this will be the, the, the philosophy, of, uh, uh, of di this will be the attitude of both sides that they can agree upon. I think, and Jerusalem should be an open city, uh, we can work something out. And this is the most important thing, how to get there. What I was showing you was the light at the end of the tunnel. Now let's look for the tunnel. Is there a tunnel? And uh, this is, again, uh, security Israel's needs for security. This is part of the roadmap. Israel, is, Israel must remove unauthorized outposts, part of the roadmap. Now, what is missing is a relevant timetable because, according to the roadmap, uh, the Palestinian state should have by now also celebrate its second anniversary in, uh, because it should have been by the end of 2005. Now we are at the end of 2007. So, of course, we need a relevant timetable for negotiations and maybe benchmarks. And I'd invite it, but I think that we need stickers, sticks and carrots, or we need uh, a clear and vigorous international American involvement with, with sticks and carrots. Um, and uh, what we need is the process to be immune against violence from both sides that violence will not be a pretext to stop the process, that the message to people who are not interested in the success of the process should be very clear. You will not be able to, nothing will stop it, as long as both sides are committed. What I mean is that the, the radical uh, parties, both in Israel and in Palestine, will not have the upper hand. Thank you very much. Okay, we have about 20 minutes for questions if we, uh, if we want to uh, give just a bit of time for people to get books if they're interested. Um, question, just identify yourself. Uh, Seth, you were, you were in the middle of a question just okay. before. You, you were about to ask, so why don't you be the first? Um, first of all, my, my first point I want 
my first question is concerning uh, the distinction you make between Zionism and settlement. This is very, very convenient that you hear in Israel that this is different from Zionism. I want to ask you, do you think the people who were kicked out in the Jordan Valley in 48 and then kicked out for the settlement see any difference? It, it is the same thing. Just because it happened in a different time doesn't make it any different. So I think your distinction between drawing the settlements as opposed as an enemy of Zionism is pretty, doesn't really hold to scrutiny because I think settlements are the natural extension of Zionism. And uh, I, I see no difference between one of the two. And this brings me to the main point, which is um, when discussing the issue of peace, so you ignore Jerusalem from your analysis and you ignore the majority, you look at the majority of settlers, you find there are only a few thousand settlers that are the problem if we just get rid of them. I mean, in a nutshell, what this sounds like is, in order for peace to happen, Palestinians need to give up a lot of what is theirs, and Israelis need to give up a lot of what is for the Palestinians as well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what is Israel giving up on this? I mean, to, to achieve any sort of peace, you talk about compromises. Israel is only compromising by getting rid of what is for the Palestinians. This is not a formula for peace. And another example of this is when you talk about the, you and Samih al Abid talking about Jerusalem and the right of return, you know, it sounds like it's symmetrical, but I mean, let's be honest here. Israelis can still go to Jerusalem, and Israelis can immigrate, uh, Jews from all over the world can still immigrate to Israel. Millions of Palestinians can't go back. So there's a little bit of a difference between being, between having to pray a few meters away from where you would want to pray, considering that you're probably not even going to pray, and between millions of people who are being denied the right to go back to their homes. So, I mean, how, how, just, how, how do you think you could sell this to a Palestinian like well, first of all, there is a difference because uh, the uh, the PLO has accepted 242, Resolution 242. Resolution 242 is suggesting that Israel will go back to the 67 lines. It has to be recognized, secure borders. It doesn't say that Israel has to, to go back to uh, the 40 now, to the Armistic line. Okay, so this is, this is the terms of reference. This is the terms of reference of since Madrid, since we started negotiating with the Palestinians. The letter of invitation that was accepted by Arafat was 242. So we are not negotiating Haifa. We are not negotiating Jaffa. This was accepted by the Palestinian. So this question should be uh, directed not to me, but to the PLO. But we're still negotiating the right of return. Now, now, the right of return... Uh, I don't think Saif was suggesting negotiating high power. Yeah. No, no, I'm no, talking no. about the right of return. You were talking about... The right of return, the right of return... I can, first of all, I can tell you that there are some experts who argue that 194 does not mean the right of return, okay? The right of return, the, the, the phrase right of return does not appear in 194. But I wouldn't go into this. I want, what I want to see is an agreement. I don't want to see an argument. You know, I, yes, I make a living out of covering the speech process and writing about it. But if we will keep arguing about it, further, you know, I'll tell you more than that. We spent so much time on the right of return that we forget the refugees. I told Arafat in one of our, I think this was in our last meeting, after, you know, after the interview when I turned off the, uh, the tape recorder and we had lunch together. And I asked him, do you think it's fair to hold the refugees as a bargaining chip? Why don't you start solving their problem bottom up? At the same time, you can negotiate top down. The, the, the principle, but give them the option, at least to those who want to immigrate to the West Bank, to Canada, or to get the money, okay, to rehabilitate, to send their, their children to school in Syria or in Jordan. And let's deal with Lebanon, because we know Lebanon is a different issue. You know, Lebanon is a racist country towards Palestinians. They're doing crimes against Palestinians. Israel is not behaving to Palestinians as bad as the Lebanese, and you know that. There is no official law in Israel. Israel discriminates 
Palestinians. In Israel, I mean, the Israeli Palestinians. But there is no law that bans them for getting driving license or to become doctors. Okay? So we should, uh, I believe that instead of spending so much time, and yeah, we can discuss the right of Hitler. I think that we should have, and Israel should, I spoke to Tsipi Livni about it, she agreed with me, but she's doing nothing. We, the Israelis, have the responsibility to go to the international community, to the World Bank, and say, put a, a fund of $20 billion and start dealing with it. I think it's not fair to the refugees to do this. So, yes, we can sit here in New York and discuss the right of return. So we've been talking for hours about settlements and about this and about what the Palestinians have to give up. Why is it that when we talk about the right of return, you told me we need to stop arguing and we need to start looking for a solution? Because when it comes to you, what you have to give up, it suddenly becomes, oh, we get the World Bank to pay $20 billion. I'll why tell can't you, you why. argue about this? I mean, it, there's not going to be a solution you if you keep telling me that you have to give up. And when I tell you you have to give up, you tell me we need to stop. No, because this is something that I will not give up. Because at the end of the day, they will not go to Israel. This is what I'm saying. So at the end of the day, they will have to choose between four options. Let them start choosing now. Okay, let's say those who want to go back to Israel, okay, will wait at uh, where they are now, okay, for the final settlement. But those who prefer, okay, to get the money that we owe them for their assets in Israel, why shouldn't they get the money now, That's yesterday? The point. The point is that this is we what will I mean. not give it up. You said this. So you are the one who is saying we're not going to give this up. This is not going to make the peace process go on Does anymore. Why don't we let other people ask questions okay. and you can come back to this. I'm not saying what I just want to explain to you. It's not that I, if it was up to me, perhaps I would consider it. What I mean is practically, there is no Israeli government. You can wait another 200 years or more. It is not going to happen. You know, I represent maybe 5% of the Israelis. Okay? So let's say that I am willing to give you the right of return. So what? I read your book, and I think it's a very good book. I read the Hebrew version, and I'm afraid the English version is is not. Uh, we cut out. Uh, we cut. We had to cut about uh, forty percent. It's important for history to have the full translation for the next time. Who would buy one thousand pages? I have a question about uh, the settlements today. Do you have any statistics about the growth of the population in uh, East? in Jerusalem, in the occupied part of Jerusalem, and the settlements, say, in the past uh, three or four years, uh, any information about the so-called illegal outposts? Have they removed anything, any outposts? Where is it going? Well, I would settle for not expanding them. Uh, asking me about removing, <laughs> I would be very happy if uh, they would not, uh, they keep growing, but on the other hand, uh, there is uh, negative immigration in uh, some settlements, such as Ariel. Ariel is shrinking. Yes. Uh, I mean, in, in a, a town, they call it a town, of 16,000 or 70,000 people, if uh, the total growth of population was 100, and uh, the natural growth there is about 2.5%, uh, this is negative. And uh, this is the case with Malay Ephraim. Even in the orthodox settlement of Emmanuel, there is negative immigration. People, uh, people don't believe that we are going to stay there. There, there are some even stories about people who there are there are tragedies here because the east of the wall, east of the separation you wall? see Israel. The Israelis are not only cruel to the Palestinians who live in the occupied areas. Territories. They're even cruel to the Jews who live there. And I'll tell you how. Uh, since we are talking now, it's very clear, every day you read in the newspapers that we are going to get out of there. Uh, people are not very keen of buying property. So people who want to move back to Israel cannot find buyers. There are people who are getting into trouble, they cannot pay their mortgage. And the banks are not willing to take the property. 
reminds you about what's happening. It's the same crisis as in the United States, but some of them are very poor people, and they cannot afford, so they're they, they kind of trapped. I went one day to one of those settlements, a secular settlement, Male Ephraim, which is in the, you know, near the Jordan Valley. It's on the west side of the Jordan Valley. And uh, I met with, with people there. And there was a woman who said that she just came back uh, from, she spent the uh, summer vacation with her children in Jerusalem with her parents. And she, she said that when they came back home, she told her children, welcome back to hell. And uh, they, they would love to get out of there, but they can't afford to do this. So um, the only settlements that are growing are the orthodox settlement on the Green Line, such as Modi'in Elite and, uh, um, and Beitar Elite and Amos, because the orthodox don't have enough room in, in, in Mea Sharim, in Jerusalem, and they don't have enough money, so they move there, not for ideological. I think that the, the settlers know that they are in trouble because they have exhausted the, their ideological grassroots. If I may follow up, do you see any political power that will move the settlers, either in Israel or in the United States? I mean, the only I, I, just, I just, I mean, this talk with us, you know, I've heard this talk in, during the Oslo year, and everybody was very optimistic. Yeah. Only the international community can do it. Even if Israel wants to do it, if the, if, even if the Israeli government would like to do this, they will need the international community to put pressure in order to justify it domestically. Actually, I want to follow up uh, on what you were saying. Uh, my name is Tanya Domi. I, I work at the university. Uh, what I'm interested in is this upcoming Annapolis uh, meeting and just how much do you expect out of this meeting uh, with the Bush administration really in its last months? Uh, and does Tony Blair bring anything uh, to any of these processes, uh, you know, in terms of his role, maybe perhaps in relationship to Europe, when you're talking about the international community, because quite frankly, from my personal standpoint, I can't imagine that Bush is going to deliver much on this. He's been so haphazard, uh, we've been in and out, and uh, I, I just haven't seen really a sustained commitment that is competent or effective. That's my viewpoint. On the other hand, we, I can give you three examples of president, lame duck presidents who, who took uh, great efforts. Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan, during the transition. He recognized the PLO. He started the negotiations with Bob Petro in Tunis. And Bush, and, and Bush Sr., who, uh, who was, did this while he was running for, you know, for second term for elections, that uh, he, he stopped uh, the uh, loan guarantees because of the settlements. And he was he was not lame duck, but he was even it was right. even more difficult because he needed the Jewish vote, or the Jewish money, or both. And he still did this. So um, you know we have three lame ducks. Abu Mazen is a lame duck. You know he lost Gaza and he's about to lose the West Bank if uh, if uh, Annapolis will not uh, you know bring us back to something. And uh, and Olmert, of course, with uh, a race between the police and Vinograd, who will put their hands first on him. So, so I, I don't know. Sometimes, you know, there is the strength of the weakness, that uh, these people have nothing to lose. So they can gamble on the, the last chip. Sir, uh, just so it was my name, I used to work for the UN. The, uh, there are two Israelis who've had rather shaking things to say. Uh, recently. One of them is uh, General, retired General Yoha Island, who was the National Security Advisor. Yes. Uh, and uh, the other is um, 
architect who teaches at Goldsmiths College in London, named Eyal Weitzman, who's written Yeah, he just published a book. Exactly, uh, The Hollow Land. Yes. Hollow Land, the Israeli of Architecture of Occupation. I was at his book presentation recently. Now, they both say that a, uh, each for their own reasons, that a Palestinian state as is available, as the Israeli uh, state is able to allow for it, uh, is not viable within the existing, uh, within historic Palestine. This is what Yoha Island said. What uh, Weizmann says is that because of the very closely knit three-dimensional uh, aspects of the uh, occupation, you just can't disaggregate them uh, anymore. Uh, is a two-state solution still viable? Is my question to you. From a territorial point of view, what I, I showed here, I think that Geneva is suggesting a viable Palestinian state. If uh, it will be also connected to Gaza, it will be a safe passage to Gaza. And uh, uh, if uh, Israel and the international community will allow the, uh, the economy to recover after what happened in the last seven years, I think economy is, is one key to this. It's more important than a uh, few percents here or there. Um, if they, uh, like they are planning, you remember, of course, those industrial zones in Eras that was closed, and uh, uh, in Taukumie, uh, near, uh, near Janine, and uh, with uh, foreign investments, what Shimon Peres was playing with, and they're still, now they're talking about this uh, Valley of Peace and the Jordan Valley to bring the water, and the Palestinians will be involved in this with saving the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea that is dying. I think it is it is possible. I think that Gyoa Island never believed in a two-state solution, so I'm not surprised. Now, uh, the bad news is that uh, yesterday somebody told me that uh, he heard from Barack that Barack is questioning the two-state solution. So what's Barack's solution? More of the same. Yes. No, uh, what do you mean more of the same? More of the same. Is, it means that uh, we... You remember what he said, that we should wait until we will have... Uh, the technology, uh, the system that will be able to uh, shoot down the uh, Qassam missiles. Until then, we shouldn't withdraw from the territories. So, you know, maybe it will take us two years to develop this, and then we'll find out that they have new missiles. So we need another two years to develop a new system. I, I think that uh, Eud uh, uh, Barak, first of all, he wants to be prime minister besides everything. But he doesn't, have, he doesn't have an answer. He says, well, we will have to wait until the uh, Palestinians uh, will become more realistic and will we'll realize what is uh, possible. Um, the Labour Party doesn't exist, actually. Let me conclude the questioning, because we have, to, we have to wrap up. Uh, it's not really a question. It's just an observation. And you can obviously, I'd like to hear your opinion. My Turkish friends talk about what they call the deep state in Turkey. You know, you have presidents, and you have prime ministers, and you have elections, and you have parties, yeah, I mean. and you have parties. But there is something they call a deep state, a republican structure established in the Ataturk period. Army, defense industries, intelligence, and republican cadres throughout the bureaucracy who represent something that stays whatever changes. And I mean, my observation over the past 16 or 17 years is that on the underneath the political level in Israel, there seems to have been a drive since the early 1990s, which has not stopped and which seems to have uh, been directed in practice, whatever the reasons were, I'm not sure, at establishing unbreakable form of control, whatever the outward forms were. And I think that, that the defense establishment is part of it, but it's not just the defense establishment. The security 
services are part of it, but it's not just that. How would a politician deal with that? That seems to me to be the problem in, in this country, to some extent, when you want to change a defense program. You can't stop these planes. You can't stop these missile systems. You can't stop them. There's no way. They have, a, they have a, an existence which is politically cemented, which is part of industry and government and so on. It's almost unstoppable. The same thing is true in some ways in Turkey. And I see this, the, the, whole, the whole enterprise for control of the territories, whether you withdraw from them or not, you still control them. Uh, how does that? How does that change? I don't. I don't see how we get from that to. I don't even want to talk about it. Was any change in the status quo, in terms of, 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 of ending occupation and, and stopping settlement? However, whatever that leads you to. Actually, the two examples from the last uh, seven years that show that when the government um, makes the decision and uh, insist on uh, carrying it out, it happens. The, the IDF's establishment, including the chief of staff, was against the withdrawal from Lebanon and against the withdrawal from Gaza, and still it happened. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the establishment, including Eud Barak, if you remember, as chief of staff, was against Oslo, and Rabin signed it. Actually, we have a very solid 70 members of the Knesset, a coalition of 70 members of the Knesset from both sides of the aisle who are for a two-state solution. And even in the, in the army, still, maybe you know, it's going to change because you see more and more yarmulkes, skull crops, in the, yeah. Yeah, more and more settlers there. But still, the majority of uh, the members of the uh, Matkal, of the uh, general staff uh, understand they, they look at this the way I I presented here that what's the alternative if it's not two state solution what's the alternative so they understand but you're right when we, you were talking I was thinking about something that wasn't mentioned and is not mentioned in the media uh, and it was not in the presentation the question of airspace who controls airspace in the West Bank? Now, I was talking about land. I can tell you that when it came up in Camp David, it was a big issue. Actually, the deal there was that we will have the control over the airspace, and the Palestinian will have, in return, what we are going to give them is the control over the safe passage inside Israel between Gaza and the West Bank, which is sovereign out of Israel, territory. sovereign Israel territory. And uh, I was told that if Olmert will dare give up the control over the airspace in the West Bank, he will have intifada from the Israeli Air Force. There you are. Okay, let, <laughs> some of you have other questions. Yes. You can ask him privately. Because I have one comment I think it's important. Okay. He's Israeli, he won't give can, up. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I made it important because I don't know your name, but, but you're, Akiva said that his position represents about 5% of Israel. In a good day. I don't. I think Akiva's position of the two state solution, 67 border, no right of return, present 25 to 30% of the Israeli population. The right of return, the objection to the right of return, I would say the position held by 99.5% of Israeli Jews whether it's right or wrong, but this is theater effects. My, my I'm, I'm going to let you discuss this afterwards. I want to ask you to thank, join me in thanking Akiva. Thank you very much.